And the way that people interact with sales materials and marketing materials hasn't changed. The same exact triggers uh, will um, will in, uh, motivate somebody, a, a, an accredited investor, to want to learn more and then to actually act uh, and invest with you. Nothing's changed. Even though it's online, the, 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 the techniques are the same. What's cool about the tech is figuring out how to how to uh, read the data, all right, and understand which ideas you have that you're testing are working better than others. But apart from that, nothing's really changed, Sam. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Adam Gower, PhD, is a 30-year real estate veteran with over $1.5 billion of commercial real estate investment and finance experience. Today, he builds digital marketing systems for real estate professionals. And for those of you that don't know, Dr. Adam Gower came back on the show. Oh, gosh, it was earlier this year, April 10th, 2023. So okay. we're, we're, we're catching you kind of right mid-quarter, first third of the year. Now we're catching the second quarter of the year. Adam, uh, for those that didn't catch that first episode, there's three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show, and I'm going to ask you to answer them again really quickly if you can. In 90 seconds or less, where did you start? Where are you now, and how did you get there? Uh, right. First of all, thank you for having me on. And I, I always love, I, I love being on these shows where the, you know, the pre-conversation is really mellow and quiet. And then you go into the introduction. Adam Gower is the host. It's like the radio voice. Absolutely, man. We, 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 we got we to gotta make it entertaining for those that are listening. Otherwise, they're going to put everybody to sleep. I need to I need to take notes from your book, uh, Sam, because uh, I, I always do my introductions afterwards. Uh, but anyway, to answer to answer your question, where did I start? OK, I started hundreds of years ago, actually, uh, in the early 1980s. It was a very interesting time to start because uh, in those days, mortgage rates. I remember, Sam, when I first put money in the bank uh, in the early 80s, I got 12 percent interest on deposit. <laughs> Imagine that. 12%, zero risk, guaranteed money. Wow. Uh, and uh, and mortgage rates were pushing 20%. It, it was a very different time. I remember that. Uh, that, might, uh, that might figure in what we're going to talk about later today. So that's not much where I started. Uh, I started pulling wires for an electrician and then eventually started raising money uh, for a ground-up multi-family developer. Second question was, you got to remind, I've got, a, I've got a memory of, you know, whatever... A steel trap, a memory like a steel trap. We can only hold one thing at a time. <laughs> and it's very difficult to get anything out of that trap. I completely Exactly, understand. yeah. It just, right. it just sits there kind of dormant. Where'd you start? Question number two is where are you now? Ah, right. So spinning forwards, however many years that is, unfortunately, 40 odd years. I don't like to admit that. It makes me seem really old. Uh, but uh, anyway, so today, so what we do is uh, we build... Uh, digital marketing systems uh, and help people build digital marketing systems so they can raise capital online. We focus exclusively on commercial real estate. Mm. Our clients manage probably over 35 billion uh, AUM and have raised over a billion dollars uh, using our systems over the last few years. So that's that's what we do now. I just I got addicted to the idea of digital online syndication when it became legal, I, I raised over half a billion myself and it would all been in person, sitting with people, traveling, having people travel to me. It's just brain damage. So when it became legalized, oh my goodness that you could do it online. I just decided to switch and uh, and that's what we do. That's what we do now. Yeah, it's, I really enjoy it. It's like a hobby. It's, I enjoy it so much it's like a hobby. <laughs> it's like a hobby. Good for you. Yeah. I don't know that going to work is a hobby for me yet. So maybe I need to take a page out of your uh, book. And well, you know, it's what I tell my boys, you know, you got to do, You, I've got, you know, three sons and I tell them, you got to do what you really enjoy. If you, if you do what you enjoy, you'll never work. Right. <laughs> Basically, it'll always be just joyful. And, in, you know, you'll, you'll just look, spring out of bed in the morning and look forward to the day ahead. Oh, that's for certain, man. I, I've always wondered that about about people that watch the clock. 
Like when, when mm. four thirty or five o'clock happens and I know I got to go hang, not don't have to, but I get to go play with the kids. Cause I know I can't leave all the kids at home with just my wife. So it's like, okay, I've got to wrap up work. But I'm like, how in the world is it four thirty or five o'clock already? Like, I never look at a clock and say, gosh, I wish it would speed up. I'm always going, I wish it would slow down. I need more time. I need more time. <laughs> right. True. I've never gotten to Friday afternoon. I'm like, man, thank goodness it's Friday afternoon. I'm like, is, is it really all right? I got everything done. You're yeah, right. no way. It says all no right. entrepreneur ever. Exactly. All right. So what was the, uh, question three? Question, what was we already the... answered it, which is where are you now? Oh, and so you oh just... that was question three. Okay, good. Yeah, where'd you all start? Right. Where are you now? Oh, I know. That's a lie. See, I can't remember my own question. Where you start? start? Where are you now? And where are you headed? How did you, how'd you get there? Oh, how did I get there? All right, I will tell you that, but I'll connect the dots between yeah. pulling wires for an electrician and raising money for multifamily and what we do now. So the, the simple story is like this. So during the, and it's important, actually, it's a good question that you ask, and it's changed probably since the last time we spoke because of where we are in the uh, in the cycle, in the commercial real estate cycle at the moment. So the last uh, major downturn, uh, and this is a major one, this one we're going through now, uh, was uh, 2007, really, is when it really started with a vengeance. Uh, and I, in uh, in summer of 2007, I sold everything I had. Actually, really liquidated everything. It's got out. And uh, I ended up uh, working for East West Bank. They were one of the major, actually, the biggest regional bank in California, uh, and they were really uh, they they had some challenges because they had raised they had uh, done um, a, a lot of uh, real estate collateralized lending and a lot of those uh, real estate deals were or those those loans were non performing right people had stopped paying there was a lot of problems and so they brought me in to help clean the balance sheet by selling the notes I did some workouts and then subsequently I ended up at uh, I'll cut out a couple of steps but I ended up at Colony Capital. Uh, working on a seven billion dollar loan uh, loan portfolio or portfolio of non-performing loans, uh, and that was a whole different cycle as well. Um, and um, and then when the uh, then when the market started to pick up, uh, it, and uh, around two thousand and twelve, uh, I started doing seed investing. So for totally different, you know, I've made some money. Uh, the downturn actually treated me very well. And uh, uh, I started looking at these little startups. Sam, it was like a different world. I moved into a, uh, interestingly, you know, a lot of these things kind of dovetail into what's going at the moment. It wasn't a WeWork, uh, but it was similar to a WeWork. It was a startup incubator. It was like this huge warehouse uh, with the open desks and open seatings, and you could rent a desk permanently. So I had all my stuff on my desk. But it was basically working in a warehouse. Sam, I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. I was surrounded by these bright students, uh, you know, half my age and more. Uh, and I did some teaching at the university as well. But it was just the vibe in there and the energy. And you could hear people talking and doing presentations and walking around. It was just really high energy. And so when the Jobs Act, and I I was investing in some of their little startups, I wrote, wrote some checks, like, that oh, sounds kind of cool. But they were talking a different language. I'd never heard this language before, SEO and uh, SOAS and uh, Google Analytics and you name it, website. It was like everything was brand new. It seemed like rocket science to me, like it was completely impenetrable. Um but the uh, Jobs Act passed in 2012. So very, you said 90 seconds. We're going to give you 90 minutes if you don't stop me. Uh, but uh, the Jobs Act passed, and it suddenly allowed sponsors. It actually allowed anybody to sell, technically sell securities online. What that meant was that you could raise money online. I just saw that and thought, OMG. This, like, my entire life has been chasing around, trying to find good, uh, investor leads and then nurturing them in person. And now I can scale that like absolute scale, perfect scale, right? You can reach everybody all the time, everywhere, all the time online, instead of having to knock on doors, like kind of literally knock on doors. Hey, is there somebody home, right? Do you want to invest? Uh, and so I started to uh, learn uh, the, the art of uh, digital marketing, of marketing online. 
And I forgot your question again already, but I'll just kind of wrap up anyway. How did I get to where I am? Uh, and it just went from one thing to other. In fact, I started, Sam, interesting, I started with a podcast. Uh, and uh, and I taught myself how to produce a podcast, how to build, which isn't trivial. You know, you're sitting there with a lot of tech, 800, how many ever episodes you've got, and a big tech, you've got a gorgeous mic, and, re- you know, nice background. But when you started, you scratch your head, right? What do I do? Oh my God. Like, how am I going to record? I'm going to clean up the audio. Is it going to be video? How do I get it out? Where do I put it? What is Libsyn? How do I distribute? It's like a million different questions. Um, so it's actually... A million. Go ahead. It's, it's nope. like you don't... You, so I right. figured all this stuff out just like you did. And then I built websites. And then I built marketing funnels. And then I started putting them all together for clients. Mm. Uh, and that's what we've been doing. That's how basically how it started. That's really cool. I think one one word that you used that is it's a common feeling uh, as especially here recently on gosh, because we have our hands in the laundry business uh, and then we have our hands in the RV resort business and and then setting up all the marketing campaigns for those various businesses and hiring third party ad agencies to handle all of that online. You said Hmm. impenetrable. Like I look at this and literally I got I got the 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 the. I don't know what the wrong the, the word for it. I might use the right word for it, but basically that here's the plan of action. And like you said, they're throwing out acronyms. They're talking geofencing. They're talking this right. and that and the other and how we're going to, I'm just like, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Just where do I, can I just mail you? Can I just give me a credit card? And just, <laughs> That's right. I All know. I want is more business. Get it. Get it. <laughs> Get it for and me. The, and the ROI care, needs man. to be there. That's it. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, I don't care if it's 10 grand a month. It brings I actually me- find it- the whole process really interesting, actually. You I- know, what's what's particularly interesting about it, Sam, we're looking at my, as I look up here, I have books. Uh, my entire room is books, by the way, apart from this whiteboard behind me. But, the, the, you know, what we're talking about actually uh, these are tactics and techniques and strategies uh, for um, selling and marketing and selling that have been around for a very, very long time. The reason I'm looking up here is there's a couple of books. There's Robert Collier Letter Book, which is amazing. It was written in 1920, I think. And then there's My Life in Advertising, Scientific Advertising. What's he called? Scientific Advertising by uh, John Hopkins. And there's a bunch of books like that. What's cool about it, Applied Business Correspondence, what's cool about it is this stuff was written 100 years ago about the way that they did marketing, direct mail, where they'd send out, literally send out mail to sell some of the things they said, you know, three buy three feet of books. <laughs> That's one of the things I remember. It's the coolest idea. Buy three feet of, book, three feet of books for your bookshelves, you know, whatever. Um, pay on the drip and here's a coupon and whatever. But the tactics and techniques are exactly the same online. Why? Because human psychology has not changed. Now, the way that and the way that people interact with sales materials and marketing materials hasn't changed. The same exact triggers uh, will um, will in, uh, motivate somebody, a, a, an accredited investor to want to learn more. And then to actually act uh, and invest with you, nothing's changed. Even though it's online, the, the 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 techniques are the same. What's cool about the tech is figuring out how to how to uh, read the data, all right, and understand which ideas you have that you're testing are working better than others. But apart from that, nothing's really changed, Sam. Right. No. And that's, and that's it. I mean, there, there comes, what what do you recommend to people? I mean, because there comes a point where we can't, we all can't be experts in everything. Mm -hmm. I can't, I cannot, and I don't have the mental bandwidth to become an expert in online digital, you know, pay-per-click marketing. I really don't. Mm -hmm. It's, I know it's not rocket science, you know, as you said, it's uh, you got to figure it out, but I don't have the, the cognitive bandwidth to absorb and understand that. Right. Is that the gap you are filling in your business? Is- yeah, we we do that. I, I mean, the way to decide whether or not it's worth doing, right? Just talking to you, it's, it's interesting that you bring this up. So we can talk hypothetically, we can talk very specifically. So being sure. specific about your comment. Uh, so the way to do this uh, is to, you've really got to look at how much money you're putting in yeah. 
to the process and how much money you're getting out at the back end. It sounds kind of, you know, a bit silly to say it's because it's so obvious. Right. But that is what you want to do. So let's say you've, you've got a laundry, right, a laundromat somewhere. And uh, I'm not that experienced in laundromats, to be honest sure. with you. But I imagine that you still you can do what you can advertise and you can get contracts, you know, from local sports teams. And there's all kinds of things that you can do to, you know, kind of scale the thing up. But you also want local students to know about it. You do coupons, promos. I really don't know. You put in tech. There's all kinds of stuff that you want to do. But you also want people to know about that. Right. So whatever your total cost of advertising is. You want to be looking at what is the return on that spend. And the, the acronym is return on ad spend. Yep. So that's going to include however much you're spending on the advertising. By the way, this applies 100% exactly the same to raising capital for uh, for equity. Mm. Uh, well, it actually doesn't. It's actually more technical. It's, it's harder for equity mm. because in your case, you would, you would say, okay, I'm going to run a campaign. I'm going to pay the agency however much a month. We're going to actually invest however much we're going to invest in this, uh, uh, in the, um, you know, in in the paid ad itself, however much you're going to spend in that. Let's say you spend 10000 And I'm pulling this out of my ear. I have no idea how much money you make in a laundromat at 25 cents a pop. I don't know how that works. But anyway, let's say you spend 10000 or $1,000 on your advertising and your agency. You know pretty much if, you have made that money back if you do the campaign properly, right? You could do a coupon, right? You do a coupon for a certain period of time and you can see how many people actually use that coupon. Was it worth the ad spend or wasn't it, right? Was it worth it? You've also got to look at lifetime value, right? If somebody comes in for the first time, they might only spend $10. I don't know. Again, I've no idea. But now suddenly if they buy a membership, I don't know if you have membership, if you've got a recurring membership model, and they sign up. Now, you know, you've got this lifetime value. So you can start looking at it in that context and determine whether or not the campaign worked. The key, though, with any kind of marketing these days, as, as it was always, even 100 years ago, uh, was to test ideas. Don't be afraid of trying something. You know, you've, I've, I've just pulled an ad campaign that we've got on Facebook. It wasn't doing very well. All right. Most of my campaigns, uh, you know, they run positive. I make more money than the campaign. We're running just killed a campaign this morning that wasn't. It was losing money. It's like, you know what? Let's kill the thing. Can't be bothered. I actually don't even want to revamp it. So I'm just going to stop the campaign. But the key is to test. And the chances are that you will test multiple different ideas and ways of let's get back to raising money for real estate. You will test all kinds of different ways of raising money, uh, uh, finding accredited investors, nurturing them and converting them. And probably nine out of 10 those of those ways won't work. Mm. You know, we put nine out of 10 ways that we try don't work. Oh, my goodness. But the ones that do, we double down on. And those are the ones that we roll out to our clients. So I actually invest a lot of money testing different ways of marketing. Most of them lose. Right? <laughs> you know, they're fails. But the ones that win, those are the ones that we take to our clients. And then we we we, we double down on those. Right, right. And, and, and that's and that's. um having that patience, that kind of, that, that kind of iterative patience to go, okay, we're going to put this campaign out there. We're going to see how it does. Do we like it? Did it perform? Yes, no, analyze it, start back over. I mean, it, that, that process sounds like it's ongoing for you. I mean, really for the life of however long you're doing this. Well, yes, but I think life is like that, isn't it, Sam? I mean, I, I was, I just was reading your uh, some of the stuff on your website before we connected and you did multifamily and you did, uh, I forget, not mobile homes, but something else. And now you're focused on laundromats. Well, right. that is the same process, right? It's a, a process of trial and error. You try something, you work it, either does well, it doesn't work well, sucks up your time, it doesn't suck up your time. You find that you've got a niche, something, so you double down on that and you just focus on it because it's the one that really worked for you and everybody's different. So it's not anything to kind of get a little bit more esoteric, I suppose, uh, if we talk about life, the universe and everything. But it is life. That's how you kind of deal with life. You test ideas, you test stuff, you go on vacation. Let's. Why don't we try such and such? Never going back there, right? You yeah. try it, didn't work. Or you go somewhere and it's amazing and you book the minute you get back home for next year. Right.
it's life is like that. You just try stuff. And if it works, you do more of it. And if it doesn't, you move on. You move on. That's exactly. Yeah, I've got one of those vacation uh, memories in my book here. Recently. The good ones or the bad ones? It was a bad one, unfortunately. Uh, I was like, you were never doing that. I'll tell you something, Kath and Sam, I'm going to tell you right now. I went to a hotel. My kids were just at, at camp. I took my wife. I like to go to the, you know, we kind of splurge when the kids were away. I took them to a four, we went to this supposedly fabulous four-star hotel resort. I figured we'd go away. I treat my wife. We spend a lovely time, kind of a staycation here in California. The bloody room had duct tape holding the thing. To, I could not swear to you, it was duct tape on the floor instead of a thing. I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely disgusted. <laughs> And I know this business. I know the owners. I know the management companies. Like, guys, this is not cool. <laughs> he got out. <laughs> and you know what they offered me? They came back, the manager, the, the hotel manager, when I wrote and complained about this thing. She offered me, she said, we'll give you a free night. Oh. Like, no, wait a minute. I'm just complaining. <laughs> it's like going to a restaurant and saying the food is dreadful. <laughs> and they said, it's all right. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you come back again? We'll give you some more dreadful food. <laughs> what that's oh man that's very very yes very true it's the way you live and learn though it's an iterative process just as you hey listen so hang on sorry we're kind of going off on a bit of a tangent because i'm a bit hyper caffeinated but what do your what do your listeners want to hear about uh, raising capital at the moment let's give them something really uh tangible and act you know something you can use when you leave the call today that's absolutely. I'm, I'm glad we're making this segue because there's there's two things I want to talk about. One yes. is how you are changing your capital raising strategy because capital raising has become immeasurably harder, mm -hmm. I think, for everyone. Uh, I'm certainly seeing that in what we're doing. People are sitting tight. They're holding on to their wallets. They're just kind of going, oh, crud. Like you said, maybe it was you that said this or maybe it was the last podcast guest. I think it was maybe the last one we were talking a seven prep on a multifamily deal just isn't that compelling when I can get five and a half at the credit union. Right. Like what, what are you guys doing? What are some strategies you're taking right now that are, and again, not that we want to convince people to invest, but we want to give them compelling reasons to invest. What are you guys doing differently? Well, yeah, I would say that uh, it's not that you want to convince people to invest. No. You want to give people a solutions to the problems that they have. Uh, and that is, if you've got a good asset class uh, and uh, you are able to make money, then you have what investors want. You've just got to be able to articulate what it is that you have. That's that's kind of the way I think about this business is that really, uh, you know, a successful real estate sponsor has exactly what everybody wants, right? You've got ongoing income, passive income, which is just an IRS term, but on you're offering ongoing income on your investment and to build wealth who doesn't want that right everybody wants that right the challenge is that investors everybody is skeptical so they hear about you the first time and you say here i'm going to give you passive income and build your wealth that's what they want but they're skeptical they don't trust you they want to be sure that you're not you know in a basement somewhere you know Pill, putting it in your pocket and whatever, buying Rolls Royces all the time with their money. Right. right? So you've got to get over that hurdle. Now, during the good times, it's actually not difficult because people are making money hand over fist and they're just looking for alternatives. They're less skeptical because there's less bad news in, in the news right. about what's going on. So during a downturn, and this is also true, in fact, during uh, good times, but particularly during a downturn, there are two things that you have to do, right? So these are practical. So we've underlined this podcast to this point, whatever minute we're at here, right? Now this is something you can actually take away and use immediately. The first thing that you have to do is address the concern that your prospects have uh, immediately. So whatever that concern might be, don't hide away. Don't hide that and pretend it doesn't exist. Deal with it immediately, because if you don't deal with it immediately, no matter what else you say, the conversation that your prospect is going to be having in their own mind is, yes, but what about this? And today, and we know this from the advertising campaigns we run for clients uh, and also from a, uh, a multi-sponsor investor sentiment survey that we ran recently, investors 
including you probably, you as in you, dear viewer or listener to this podcast, are concerned mostly about protecting your money. You don't want to be losing all your money when values drop and uh, and, and you're seeing the uh, you know commercial real estate really hitting some uh, some choppy water. So the first concern you have is not to lose money. Right. So when you communicate with sponsor, I'm sorry, with prospects at the moment, the language you want to be using, language patterns you want to be using are specifically protecting the investment, protecting your investment. Don't use clever terms like principal preservation. You and I know what that means, but investors use a different kind of language. And you always want to use the same language your investors use because you want to be understood. Right. So protecting the investment is very important. So in your communications, and this can be on uh, any kind of ad campaigns that you have or any kind of newsletter you put out, uh, any kind of pitch that you put out, start with how you protect the downside. What are you doing exactly? How much debt are you taking on it? Is it fixed? Is it a variable? If it's variable, why are you choosing to do variable today? Uh what kind of leverage have you got? Have you underwritten your deal? Do you want me to stop? I see you. Close. We we are we are in the final thirty seconds, and we gotta we gotta hang hang it up. Unfortunately, ah, but this is gold. So I want you to finish out this thought because I think okay, that, I will do. That our investors and our not our investors, but our listeners are really going to get something out. Yeah. Of it. So this is really important. So you so you want to be addressing how you're going to protect their investment. That's the first thing, and then you can start. Oh, at least that needs to be the bulk of what you. Uh, uh, of your communication. The second thing that you need to do, communicate regularly. Oh my goodness. Don't just pitch all the time. Educate, talk about what's going in the market, what are going on, what are you seeing, how are capital markets, what's going on with interest rates, how are you dealing with them, what are you doing, etc. Be Don't pitch, educate about these key issues. That Those are the two things. Slash. We should have two started things. with that, Sam. No, I think it's been great. Dr. Adam Gower, thank you for taking the time to come oh. back on the show today. If our listeners want to get in touch with you and learn more about you, what's the best way to do that? GowerCrowd.com. Go to G-O-W-E-R Crowd.com. GowerCrowd.com. Sign up for the newsletter. You'll get an email from me on Wednesday with the latest newsletter. If you want to ask me a question, hit reply. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Adam. Do appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Sam. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.